It's a wonderful Friday. Welcome to PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight, she has an interest in research impact and she's being a lead in this drive, bringing together research institutions in Africa, Europe and Asia. She was recently a judged outstanding female scientist, former deputy director of research and development at the Ghana Health Service, Professor Margaret Japon. She's currently director of the Institute of Health Research at the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ho. I'm so grateful that you made yourself available for this interview. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Aisha. It's what a did pleasure. it take you to win outstanding female scientist? Hmm. I think this, this is a result of several years of work. Um, it didn't just happen overnight. Um, like you said, I, I used to be Deputy Director of Research and Development in the Ghana Health Service. And before that, I worked in the Navrongo Health Research Center. Okay. Before that, I worked in Kolibu, okay. in the Community Health Department. So oh. my research career spans mm. quite a, a number of years. Mm. The EDCTP, which is the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Platform, uh, usually puts out a call. It's a global call. Um, and they give this award every two years. Um, they've been, they included women in this award just about six years ago. Okay. Um, so what happens is that they put up an open call and they invite people to nominate uh, women for the Outstanding Female Scientist mm. Prize. Okay. Um, they usually have the Outstanding Research Team. They have um, Outstanding um, Scientists. And then they have the biggest prize, which is the Pascal Mukumbi Prize. Okay. okay. Mm. So um, they put out a call, and I had a few people call me to say they were nominating me for the prize. Wow. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you think I'm going to make this because it's a global thing? Mm -hmm. They said, well, you do things globally, so let's give it a try. Yeah. Worst case scenario, they'll tell you you didn't win it. So okay. they put it in. And because of COVID, we didn't hear about it last year. Mm. And then sometime in May this year, I got the email and I was just screaming. I was <laughs> like, oh my God, oh my God, because I, I mean, yes, they had nominated me for it, but I mm. kind of didn't think that it would be me. I always thought it would be somebody mm. else. I don't know. So yeah. now that it is you, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel good. I mean, I... When I was asked to submit my CV and the work that I had done, and I was writing it out, uh, mm. I, was, I was looking and saying, did I do all this? Sometimes you are doing something, and you don't realize you are doing so much work. But counting down all the way from Navrongo through to the Research and Development Division, through Dodoa Health Research Center, which I headed for close to 15 years. Okay. Um, there's so many research activities that we have conducted and you did rightly say research impact. Mm -hmm. um, my background is in the social sciences. Okay. Um, and working in the Ministry of Health, not being a medic, you needed to understand what was going on in health and mm. speak the language. So using all the big terms like lymphatic filariasis okay. and schistosomiasis <laughs> and <laughs> onchocerciasis, <laughs> you know. Um, you so I learned that you do not do research just for doing sake. Okay. If I'm doing some work on malaria, it has to make an impact on the society. So we've done quite a few studies which have influenced policy hmm. um, uh, at the country level. So for instance, in Avrongo, the vitamin A trials that we conducted um, influenced policy such that pregnant women and children are given vitamin A today mm -hmm. as part of the um, health service. Yeah. Um, we conducted studies on the use of rectal artesanate. So a child has severe malaria, cannot take anything by mouth, and so they give something rectally. So we okay. did the studies mm. for that, and now it's being used in the Ghana Health Service. Wow. I'm sure you've heard about the CHIPS compounds. Definitely. Yeah, so we conducted what we call the Navrongo experiment, mm. and this landed up being chips compound and the concept around it. So, yeah, so it's years of work that mm. have culminated mm. in. And we're so happy that you're making it out there. But you studied medical anthropology and epidemiology. Yes. What's that? <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> okay. So medical anthropology is the study of trying to understand what people mean 
mm. when they say they are sick okay or when they say they are unwell mm. so for instance um somebody comes to you and says my heart my makuma okay you know the doctor will pull out a stethoscope ask you to go and do lab tests but as a medical anthropologist i'll sit with you and try and find out how has your day been why do you think your heart is paining you okay and you find out that the person starts talking about the husband who she found out has a girlfriend mm. and doesn't give her money so it's affecting her heart okay so it's not because she has a physical condition it's emotional something is going wrong with her okay okay and you also know that in africa and in that can have a link yeah okay you are stressed you are emotionally drained you are unwell, you can't put your finger on it. Okay. She says, Makuma, okay. spend 10 minutes talking to the woman mm. and you find out that, oh, I'm feeling better because okay. she's had somebody talk to her. Okay. So I go behind what is making the person feel unwell mm -hmm. to understand it. Sometimes the person doesn't even need medication. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. okay. So basically that's it. Um, recently when I gave my inaugural lecture, one of the things I talked about was the way people think about malaria. Working in Dodoa, people think that there are two types of malaria, all right? Mm. The male malaria and the female malaria. Oh, interesting. Yes. <laughs> so Asrayo okay. is the female malaria, which uh -huh. is the simple malaria. You oh, take okay. um, an anti-malarial and you are fine. And you are fine. The male malaria is Asraku, okay. the one that can kill you. That should be deadly. Uh -huh. <laughs> You see, <laughs> so if, if somebody comes to the hospital, the person comes from the Danbury West District, okay. or, and the person comes to the hospital, and the doctor says, you have malaria, and you, give, you tell the person to take um, an injection, or you tell the person to take an anti-malarial, the person starts wondering whether he has the coup or the you. <laughs> now, if the person <laughs> thinks he has the you and he can just take anything and feel better, he won't believe what you are telling Sorry. them about sleep under a bed net and protect yourself and from all that. mosquitoes. I mean, that doesn't make sense to them. Okay. To them, I have asraku, <laughs> which can start from the stomach and then you get convulsion and it goes into the sky. Mm. So you can imagine. So people's concepts of ill health are completely different from the medical perspective mm. of ill health. Mm. And mm. so we, we really need to understand people when they come, understand their background to, mm. to help uh, care for their conditions. And interestingly, you, you've done a lot of research in um, malaria, um, neglected dis tropical, tropical diseases, diseases yes. um, implementation research, right? I mean, why the interest in these areas? You know, when I developed an interest in neglected tropical diseases when I was working in Avrongo, okay. all right, as part of the vitamin A trials. Mm. Now, walking through the communities in the north, you found a lot of people with big legs, mm. you know, okay. and then you found the men with hydrocils, okay, large scrotums. Mm -hmm. And we were, we wrote about it, and people said it's not possible. I mean, elephantiasis in Ghana, so we had to do further work on it. So we had the clinicians document the clinical aspects and the parasitological aspects. Mm. And I was interested, like I said, in finding out what do they think is causing the problem. Somebody has a big leg. How do they call it? Na pim pim. That's how they call it. Yes. There. Okay. Big, heavy leg. Okay. Na. Pim pim, heavy. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm. What do you think is causing the problem? Somebody mixed some herbs threw it on the ground, I stepped on it by mistake. And, and that's why I have a big leg. Exactly. Wow, that's their understanding. That's their understanding. So there, there are tablets that you take for elephantiasis of the leg, but they don't think they should take it. If you tell them it's caused by the mosquito, which it is, mm. they're like, no. I live in the same house with my brother, my father, my sister. Mm -hmm. We've all been bitten by the same mosquito. Why is it that they have it, uh, I have it, and, and they, they don't, don't have it? Okay. There's something wrong. Okay. Somebody is doing me. <laughs> so we, we had to do a lot of health education. Mm. And today we have a big program and uh, people are understanding what is going on about it. Mm. But the neglected tropical disease I'm interested in now has to do with women. Okay. It's on female genital schistosomiasis. Okay. So schistosomiasis, those who live along the river banks, mm. Um, they get infected by the parasites and then they pass blood in their urine. Mm. But then recently we found out that the issues to do with women 
were increasing and nothing was being done about it. Mm. Because the woman presents with signs like any gynecological problem, uh, painful urination, lower abdominal pains, some of them are married and do not have children. And so when they report to the health facility, they are sent to a gynecologist and nobody asks a simple question, where have you lived? Have you lived by a river? Have you been swimming in the river? So with some funding that I have from the Canadian government, we are trying to understand what is going on. Mm. Uh, we are planning on training our health workers because they really don't know much about it okay. um, so that they can recognize it, mm. be able to diagnose and treat women mm. um, with this. Uh, wow. Yeah. So it's taking you over 25 years to climb this ladder. I mean, you've gone through all the ranks. Tell me about your career uh, journey. Uh, from, I, I mean, from the beginning, you even talked about Navrongo. I didn't know about that, but I know <laughs> about Dodoa. I know about the Ghana Health Service, now University of um, Health and Allied Sciences. How has the journey been? It has been long. It has been enjoyable, but sometimes it has been painful. I know, right? Um, from you know when when you are just a researcher walking around you you don't care about what the big bosses are doing you just do your work collect the data and go away mm. but as you go up you realize that you have greater responsibility so when i was posted to the dodoa health research center um i remember very well and i always talk about it the letter i was given it says dear dr japon congratulations you've been appointed director of dodoa health research center i arrive in dodoa there's no research center <laughs> <laughs> It's just uh, a little building. It used to be the old, um, <laughs> the old district health um, administration office. So okay. it was three offices, mm. one small building. Okay. So the accountant was in one and I was in one and my research team, which were just three people at the time in one, in one room. Now, the research center in Navrungo was very developed. The one in Kintampo was also very developed. Here I was posted to Dodua, research center head, but there was no research center. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my biggest headache was, how am I going to move this from a tiny research station sure. to an internationally renowned? So you can imagine the sleepless nights I had, mm -hmm. um, trying to link up with different partner institutions, international organizations. Um, I had young children at the time. I was married. So taking care of children, doing work, taking care of the home, um, I was active in church. I was a church council chairperson. Okay. In the Presby Church, it will be um, senior presbyter. Okay. Um, I was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, <laughs> I, sometimes I look back and I don't know how it happened, but it's, it's gone. The rest Some way, <laughs> somehow, somehow, it, somehow it, it happened. happened. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, I think it's grace mm. and uh, a lot of support from family okay. um, and, and, and friends um, mm. to be able to get mm. through. What would you describe as your biggest obstacle or challenge in climbing this ladder? The biggest challenge? Uh, that's a tough question. The, the biggest challenge, okay. Now, in the Ghana Health Service, it is doctors, nurses, pharmacists, the medical and allied health professions. Okay. Now, research in the Ghana Health Service is quite recent. Um, maybe 20 years ago, thereabout. Mm. So, um, first of all, finding the funding to be able to support the research in the research institutions was a challenge. Mm. Of course, the Ghana Health Service paid the salaries, but apart from that, you had to find your own research to be able to do uh, the work that informed policy mm. at the service. So, one of my biggest headaches was finding the money to pay the staff in the place because not everybody was on the Ghana Health Service payroll. Mm. So at the end of every month, those days, I used to dream about where can I find something <laughs> like 60, <laughs> 70,000 Ghana CDs to be able to pay salaries. That was one. Um, and then proving myself that I could make that research center viable and stay strong because it was very small. Mm. So trying to put up a building, like I said, there was no building, trying to attract funding. When you say Dodoa, people say, who are you and what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, so you had to work extra hard and try and convince people that something good could come out of that tiny research center. Mm -hmm. And then the pain of having to leave your family and spend hours 
Mm, I can imagine. You wake up in the early in the morning, do breakfast as a woman, you have to do your stuff. Definitely. Then you take the children to school, go to Dodoa from Tema mm. every morning. Mm. You are there till five, six, come back home, come and sort out homework, make sure people are asleep, <laughs> prepare for the next day, 15 years of my life. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> it, it, it was a challenge. It wasn't easy. Mm. Um, and, and being a woman, the heads of the other two research centers were men. Mm. So I felt I had to put in extra effort because I didn't want anybody to say the woman could not do it. You say that thing. It's and and uh, with God by your side, I tell you, you were able I to tell do you, it. I oh, tell you, we're I so tell proud you. of you. Thank you. Let's Thank talk you. about research into sciences, uh, because recently that conversation has come up, especially with the COVID nineteen pandemic. What's your stance on this? That countries, especially like a developing country like Ghana, should invest heavily in researching uh, into sciences. I think we should. Just yesterday, I was having a conversation with two colleagues from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And they were asking me a similar question. And they said, what do I think? And I said, you know, in Europe and other countries, they don't have malaria, mm -hmm. all right? They have the laboratory and the facilities. It's taken several years to come up with a malaria vaccine. And even that, it's about 50% efficacious. Mm. Look at COVID-19, look at the speed with which we got a vaccine mm -hmm. because it affects so many other people. Yep. They have the money and they can do it. What are we doing about it? Mm. So if you look at the sustainable development goals, they are not legally binding, but then it, it tells governments to take charge and make sure that they take responsibility for some of these things. Yeah. I think African governments should start investing heavily in research, okay. in issues that affect us. And I was happy quite recently um, to hear about the setting up of the institute to develop um, vaccines in the country, um, led by Prof. Kwabna Frempong. Mm. There was a stakeholder engagement and I heard about yeah. it. Yeah. And I was quite happy and I hope that we'll be able to do that. We do the science, we have scientists. Mm -hmm. I mean, highly qualified scientists. You go to Noguchi, you go to KNUS, you come to US. Very small, but very seasoned scientists out there. And we are capable of doing things. We don't have the tools. We need the tools, we need the funding to be able to do this. And I think government has started with setting up of that institute. I hope it will continue. It will not be a nine day wonder. And we would invest mm. in this to ensure that when there's a problem, we can develop our own vaccines and move along with it. And so as a director of the Institute of Health Research, do you lecture as well? Yes. You do? Yes. What kind of a lecturer are you? <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask my <laughs> students. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, I teach research methods. Okay. Okay. And That's I think that I didn't like. You didn't like they it? Had a lot of maths. <laughs> yeah, a lot of maths. No. You see, but it's, it's the approach. That's why I say it. You know, because I am into research, I use a lot of my research examples to teach. Okay. It makes it alive. Mm. So I remember my last class I taught, which was the, um, from the School of Allied Health Sciences. Um, you had masters and PhD students. I gave to them a research proposal I had written. Mm -hmm. And I said, we are going to follow this process in the lecture. So we went through the proposal step by step, and then they used their own problems in the class. So I teach the concept and I say, let's look at this section of the proposal and then apply it to the work that you, you want. I think, well, the feedback I got from them was that this was quite interesting. So I think there may be some who would think that, uh, what is she talking about, okay. of course, but generally I think it's, it's going well. It's at going least well. I haven't been sacked from teaching. So. <laughs> But yeah. what's your relationship with your student? Because, I mean, students can be anything. There are some who, when they pass exams, it's they pass. Yes. But when they fail, it's the lecturer it's the lecture. who fail them. Sometimes some lecturers say they get attacked, even spiritually, <laughs> physically. <laughs> what's your own story? Um, it's, it's, it's two ways. Um, recently, I had an experience with one of my students. He was supposed to work on his research proposal for his thesis. Okay. And um, I had been trying to pin this guy down 
to complete the proposal and submit for ethical review. Mm -hmm. He was doing a two-year master's. Okay. Once he finished the coursework, he disappeared to his place of work. <laughs> you call him, he will say, I'll be back. And, you'd and he will never show And up. the deadline for submitting was due. And I was going to travel. So I told him, he was in Tamale, I said, if you don't appear here tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'm not going to look at your work. And he thought I was joking. He did come. But he thought he was going to do the go back the next day. I sat with him. We went page by page from morning to evening every day mm -hmm. for three days. Oh, wow. In the end, he stayed himself for the next two days. So he was in hope for a week. <laughs> 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 and he had to finish that work. But when he finished, if I had my phone, I would have read the message. He said he's now seen the value of taking time to do his work. Mm. Because when he was out there, he was working and trying to do his research work mm -hmm. at the same time. And it wasn't really It helping. wasn't helping. It wasn't working. When you give him comments, he doesn't respond. Oh, he wow. brings the thing back. So when he sat down and focused his attention on it, he realized it was possible. It wasn't that difficult <laughs> after all. <laughs> He's already started collecting his data and he's, he's quite excited. Um, oh. uh, about about it. Oh so. Wow. <laughs> so, so you haven't had those um, issues of, I mean, those attacks, no? No, I haven't had those attacks. But they, they, you attack me, I'll attack you back with my God. By all <laughs> means. <laughs> in equal measure. Yeah, in equal measure. In equal measure. Interesting. Yeah. But what would you describe as the biggest reform needed in university education? Huh. Biggest reform? That's a tough question. Uh, we need to invest in that system. We need to really invest. You know, let me take you as an example. Um, I am told that when the University of Ghana was being set up, the schools, the institutes, the infrastructure, the roads, everything was in place. Okay. And then the lecturers came. You know how you have started, um, poor Professor Binka. <laughs> I mean, he was going everywhere the trying to find forth. money, looking for... I mean, so you, you could not focus on the real academic work because you had to sort out infrastructure. You had to sort out this. So I would, I would say that if we are setting up systems like this, maybe we should, we should put the infrastructure in place. And then when we have the management on board, then they can focus on other things to help things move a little faster because it can be a bit... A bit tedious mm. um, yeah and and the second thing is having people who are dedicated to the service of teaching mm. um, these days our young people want everything quick and fast um, when you are teaching people are not paying attention and say give us the slides give us the slides and they want to chew poor mm. so in my class I don't give out the slides mm -hmm. and I set case studies because I want people to understand the concept you give slides, and I know my students, aha, uh -huh, that's one thing that they don't <laughs> like, that I don't give them the slides. Okay. Because they, they said, you they give us the slides. They have to do more. Yes. Yeah, I mean, read around it, um, understand it. Those days, we didn't have slides. Mm -hmm. um, the prof would come and stand there with pen and write or chalk. And you have to go to Baum Library to go and read. Yep. And by the time you get to Baum Library, you can find the book, but the chapter you are looking for has been taken. <laughs> <laughs> that's so when you have to perform magic. That's the <laughs> thing, you see. So um, <laughs> um, I think I think we 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 need to be dedicated and and we need to let the students understand that they are going through a learning process, mm. and it's not just to pass, okay. but you need to imbibe whatever it is. So when you go out there, um, it it makes sense to you, and you are. You are practicing what you have learned um, in class. For us in New Hearts, it's particularly serious because we are training health professionals. Mm -hmm. So if they just do chew, pour, pass, and forget, you'll be lying in the hospital ward and you see a student who <laughs> was not doing well. <laughs> you die not because you are sick, but because you've seen this student who was not good <laughs> taking care of you. And you know, so yeah, we need to we need to get our students to be a bit more dedicated to mm. their studies and, mm. and to take it more seriously. Yeah. Professor Margaret Japon, she's my guest tonight. She has over ninety publications to her credit. She's also been reviewing a number of international journals. When we return from this break, she'll be telling us more about that. Plus 
her growing up, how did she even develop the love for science? Whose idea was it? Did she want to become something else? And her family values and lifestyles. All of that after this break. <music> Welcome back to PM Personality Profile, and my guest still remains Professor Margaret Japon, and we're having quite uh, some insight into her life. Prof, which part of the country are you from? Um, my mother is from Osu, okay. in the Greater region. Oh. Yep. And my father is from the Central region. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so my maiden name is Datsun. Okay. Yes. So you're a Fanti? Yep. You know, it's funny. Uh, Fanti's inherit, my Fanti inherit patrilineal. Okay. My, my mom. mom, Osu's side is also patrilineal. I'm, I'm <laughs> in between. <laughs> I don't know. So I choose where I want to belong. Okay. So, so for a long time, sometimes I'm from Osu. And, and if Osu people don't make me happy, I become <laughs> a Fanti. <laughs> It's a confanta. Look, I'm fancy, Papa. Oh, proper, proper. No. Into sap on chipper, which a coin when I say a catcher card, they don't break here. How would you say it? Oh, how would I they say it? They say it. They say it. I catch a driver. Oh, I'm trying to be no break and I go to Berison. And you yeah. speak Ghana as well. I speak Ghana. Oh, call and show me. Why didn't you? No, you're Ghana. Come Proper. Of your decorse. Eh, what is decorse? I haven't uh -huh. heard that one I got you there. Which one is that one? <laughs> this is a not now. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling the girl yes. to do decorse. What is decorse? Well, the girls say they do it some way, but they call it decorse. Which one? Well, I, didn't, I didn't know about the decorse. Okay, maybe you should go and ask. I'll go and ask. <laughs> the next that is time a new you go one. to so Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Mm. So this is you from um, the central I mean, specifically where? From, it's called Gomwa in Riem, okay. alias Gomwa in the trees. Ajay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in Riem is yeah. in the trees. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, it's when you, when you get to Apam Junction, you make a right and you go. Ah, yeah, that's why. People, people, when I say it, people say, have you been there before? I say, yeah, last month my father's brother died. We went to bury him. I know my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I didn't ask you. I know, I, you but know. People, people ask me. that I, When I said I went to the village, uh, people are like, do you come from a village? I say, yeah, I also have a village. <laughs> I have a village I come from, so. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. So where did you grow up? I mean, where were you born? Were you born in bread, butter, cheese, in Accra? Yes. Okay, so I was born in Accra, in Kolibu. We lived in Kanishi at Foyo. Okay. And then we moved to Tema. And I've lived in Tema all oh, your life. All my life. Apart from when I went to work in Avrongo for about five, six years. There you about. said my girl. Yeah, I met my girl. Mm -hmm. Where did you start from? Where did you have your secondary education? And then we can talk about university. Okay. So I went to Tema Parents. I met Tema Girl, mm -hmm. Tema Parents Association School. And then I went to Bipol Sohang. Oh. The light on the hill. Okay. That's and the response is Nyamini Oh. Uh -huh. Okay. So we are the light on the hill. I see. The best school. Oh. Best girls school. In Ghana. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try us. Okay, so. I, I, well, yes, I've heard a lot about Ibri girls, yes. so uh, I'm, I'm not going to challenge that. Uh -huh. But you can't challenge it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to a girls' school, so okay. I don't think I'm in the right position to actually defend that. Okay. But okay, so that's the best school in Ghana. Yes, the best girls' school in Ghana. Uh, I went to, I uh, went there one to upper six. Okay, so I was there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was fun. It was interesting. Um, Ibri girls. At the time I was there, we didn't have water, mm. but we had two huge wells mm. where you'd go with your bucket, mm. rope tied to your bucket, and then you fetch water. Okay. And then when the well dried because it wasn't raining, we had to go to a brick town. We had to go to a place called Jamaica mm. to go and fetch water. Okay. It was far. Yeah. Now, if you're a junior, 
you had to carry your bucket plus the bucket yes. of your senior. Oh, God. You walk out to town to fetch the water. And then when you are coming back, you know, if you've been to a bridge, you've seen the, the bridge. Mm. So you are climbing the bridge and then you trip and your bucket of water pours. Oh, shit means you have to go back. You have to sit on the floor and cry a bit mm. before <laughs> you... <laughs> So, yeah, so that was one of the most difficult things in Ibri, mm. um, the water situation. So I'm when sure you come... Of people who go to Ibri don't drink a lot of water. Is it because of that? It's possible. I don't remember if I wasn't drinking a lot of water. <laughs> <because> <laughs> of that, I but remember. I mean, we use water sparingly. Uh -huh. I mean, when you had to go and bath, you fetch a pail of water, do your soapy water, put it on your head, shake yourself, get another <laughs> pail. So we know how to use water sparingly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, yeah, but it was cold. It yeah, was cold. Yeah, I agree. So cold. I always look forward to coming home to bath with hot water, proper. <laughs> and up to today, my water must boil if I have to bath because wow. I can't deal with cold water. Wow. Yeah. And aside going to fetch water from a far place, what else would you describe as, I mean, some of the difficulties you had in school? Um, the rules were tough. Um, Mrs. ACB. Um, may she rest in peace. She was one special woman. Um, she called us her girls and she treated us like her own children. She mm. was a disciplinarian. Okay. I mean, in the dining hall, you had to eat with your cutlery properly. Mm. If she says your shoes are flat, they have to be flat. And she can see you from <laughs> far <laughs> off. And she will call you by name. Mm. And if you had a block one inch, She'll take the shoes off you. Wow. She was, she was strict. strict. But she she instilled in us some values that when you see somebody from a brie, especially if you pass through the hands of Auntie Joyce, you would know. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was hard, but she was a mother. Mm. And she made us understand the value of being a woman and the value of education. Mm. I mean, she had studied to a very high degree. And she wanted us to also do the same. Um, Ebri was fun. You, when you were there, you were stuck. In fact, I went to Ebri Girls because my dad used to take us to Ebri Gardens. Mm. And I loved going to Ebri Gardens. Okay. So I told myself, if I went to Ebri, then I'll go to Ebri Gardens very often. often. <laughs> now, when we went to Ebri, <laughs> when there was midterm or any holiday, they would ship us all to Ebri Gardens. And by year three, I was tired of Ebri Gardens. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I don't want to do a brie garden <laughs> anymore. Okay. <laughs> but I enjoyed the brie. Mm. I mean, it was tough. My mother had to struggle. She didn't have a car. My father had passed away at that time. But she would struggle, get a lift or get a taxi and bring me water, um, at least so that you are comfortable in a jerry can. Mm. Now I hear it's a little better. Okay. Um, but yeah. But one of the things I dreaded was some of the meals. Mm. There was one we called water music <laughs> and <laughs> i can smell it as i'm talking My about it goodness. Like it, it was like <laughs> fresh fish you don't know whether it's stew or soup and it comes with rice <laughs> oh my goodness no but i like the palm soup <laughs> i like the palm soup it was okay. very nice and the groundnut soup mm. and we had red red sometimes and i just loved the bread because it was big fresh i like bread okay um and the bread was big fresh in there so i loved the bread there yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah what yeah. did you study science no i didn't study science i loved to read okay when when i was in primary school and up to o level i wanted to do law mm. and then um during one of the holidays i wasn't well and my mother took me to tema general hospital mm. And I saw this lady in white, beautiful woman. Okay. Um, she's Mrs. Hansen. She lives in Tema. And I, 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 who is this lady? And they said she's a dietitian. Mm. I said, ah, I like, I like the sound of what she's doing, and I want to be a dietitian. Okay. So when I chose my courses in sixth form, I hadn't done home science or any of those things. I was still doing the literature and stuff, preparing my mind for that. I said I wanted to be a dietitian. And then people said, but you, you should have done some science. Okay. Then one of the teachers said, ah, there's a course in Legon. It's in home science. But there are two options, the family option and then the science option. So you can, as an art student, you can do the family option. So that's what landed me in Legon doing home science, the family option. Okay. Okay. But then 
I realized by second year that I couldn't do dietetics in Legon because there was no course like that. Mm. Today there's a course in dietetics. Okay. And so I had to go abroad to do it. My mother hasn't been abroad before. She is a poor <laughs> teacher. Where is she going to find the money from to take me abroad to go and do dietetics? So that's when my dream for being a dietitian um, ended. Mm. But then I found myself doing my national service in Kolibu, like I said, mm -hmm. at the community health department. Mm. And I was doing a lot of things in the community, collecting data, talking to people about health issues, and I developed the interest in health. Mm. So yes, I wasn't um, a dietitian, but then I was still in health, mm. talking about different aspects of health, women's health mm. and stuff. But yeah. what kind of a student were you? Were you the, um, the obedient type, uh, obey rules, or were you a bad girl? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was I a bad girl? It's, like I told you, I didn't have that many friends. Okay. I can count my friends even now. Um, I didn't have that many friends, and I, I, I never went anywhere. Okay. So people would come back from long back talking about they had been to this club, and I could hear things like they've been to KTK, and they've been here. And there. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I, when I say it, my daughters <laughs> laugh at me. I've never been into a disco before. I don't know what it looks like. They say, Mommy, it's not disco, it's club. OK, I've never <laughs> been in a club before. I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> I'd rather read a book or watch a movie. If I say watch a movie, mm. they'll tell me no. It's the movie that watches me because <laughs> I'll sleep about three times. I'll have to watch a movie three times before I end it because I sleep halfway through the movie. But that is, that is me. Um, it's, it's either I'm reading a storybook mm. or I'm sleeping or you find me, I've gone to church, I've gone for quite I, I was anti so. I, w I wouldn't <laughs> go any anything that will put me in trouble. I will not go. Uh huh. I will no. You mm. you won't catch me. Mm. Um, I I kind of like to obey rules. I I wanted to keep out of <laughs> trouble. So yeah. I but you talked about you losing your dad. At what age did you lose your dad? Ah, at age nine. Oh wow, that's quite. Yes, early. I was in primary school. Mm. Uh, would you passed. say that had an impact in growing your growing up? Yes. Um, we lived in Tema Committee 4 in Kaiser Flats. Mm. At that time, it was freshly built. Those were the days when parks and gardens would come to your house and come and clean up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the gap between my sister after me and me is five years. Okay. How many of you? There are three of us. Okay. Yeah. Um, all girls? All girls. Mm. Um, so... Um, I had quite an enjoyable life growing up. Mm. I went to, it used to be Ramsea Memorial, then it became the Swiss school. Okay. And now it's the Swiss German school, yeah. it's on the ring road. Yes. Yeah. So I went there for, is it a year or two, before we moved to Tema. Mm. And then I went to Tema Parents, and at that time Tema Parents was yeah. a, a, good, a good place to mm. be. And we lived in Kaiser Flats. Then my dad dies, and my mother says, you know what, I can't afford this house. Mm. So we moved from Kaiser Flats to Committee 8, okay. single bedroom oh. with a hall. Okay. And my mother could afford to take just me to a private um, school. school, primary school. So my, my younger sisters went to public school and she said, she can afford to invest in me so that I can also invest in, in my- oh, Are you the, el I'm the, the eldest? I'm the eldest, okay. yes, I'm the eldest mm. too invest in my sisters. Mm. Um, so, so that was it. My, my father died and things changed mm. um, because my mother was a teacher. Mm. He was a managing director at uh, British Tobacco. It used to be okay. Grand Tobacco. Mm -hmm. So he's mm -hmm. a, he was a managing BAT director. Um, yes. So that's what he used to do. So my, my, like I said, our childhood was exciting. Those were the days where we wore shoes and socks at home and <laughs> would go to Kingsway and multi yeah, stores the, the bees. Yeah, that kind of thing, <laughs> you know. And then dad died and everything All of a changed. Sudden, Ev oh. Everything changed, mm. you know. And my mom had to make us aware that things are not like it, it used, used to, to be. be. So we had to learn to adjust. Mm. Um, and and um, thank God, I mean, maybe it was good I was anti so because then I wouldn't have the opportunity of seeing things that people had and me wanting 
so, those things. But yeah. she she taught us to to um, appreciate whatever we had. She said, if we have today, would eat. If we don't have, yep. would yeah. So mm. that's the kind of thing mm. that she taught us. Mm. So um, yeah, simple living. Do what you have to do. That's how we, we were taught growing up. Mm. Is mom still alive? No, so mom. Mom also passed away something like. 30 something years ago. Oh. 30 oh. So my mom died a year after I got married. Oh. So she never saw any of her grandchildren. Oh. That was, that was, yeah. You miss them sometimes. A lot. A lot. Sometimes what when you. you, do? you when um, I, I just, I'll shed a few tears. I'll keep to myself. There are certain times where you wish they were here. Yeah. Like um, I got this award and I was like, where's oh. my mom? Um, and. I can understand. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, it's it's you you miss her. Mm. Um, when I was I was growing up, my children were young, and I had to travel a lot. I would miss my mom yep. if she were here. Mm -hmm. She would have helped. Yes, I had a lot of support mm. um, from family, my sisters. I missed my mom. Yeah, and we still miss her. There are certain things that you are doing, and you say, if mom were here, uh, somebody you could go to. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Japon has been very supportive. He has. Mm. He has. He, he, he is quite supportive. Um, when, I, when I finished my master's, um, I said I, I didn't want to go continue. I was, what do I need a PhD for? I'm working in the Ministry of Health. What do I need a PhD mm. for? And then he, he said something. He said, you know, you are sitting in the research center and people come from all over the world you teach them things, mm -hmm. they go back and they come as consultants. Yeah. Are you going to sit here and continue like, like this? this? But I had to make a decision about the type of PhD I wanted to do. I had young children mm -hmm. and the traditional PhD in the US, you had to be away for four years, mm. two years doing coursework plan. I couldn't afford to do that. Mm. So I found a program in, in Switzerland at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Okay. And most of the PhDs in Europe are like that. It's flexible. So you can work and then you can take time of a month or two to go there, develop your research, come back, mm. collect some data, go back mm. and meet with your supervisor. Mm. So yes, so that, that was the kind of, of PhD I had so that I could be home as often as I, I could and to, to take care of my children. Yeah. So, so he pushed me actually and he said, you go get that PhD mm. and, and come. I remember about six months to the end of the PhD, I was tired. I mean, mm. you read so much, you, I was missing home, <laughs> I was tired. So I called him and I said, you know, if I don't get the PhD, it's okay, it's no big <laughs> deal. I mean, I just have six months to finish. It's all right, I can come home. <laughs> and you know what he said? He said, Stay there with your disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <laughs> come in. Nate never <laughs> said that you attempted a PhD and you didn't finish. Definitely. So I had to, I had to <laughs> just sit there and finish that thing. It was hard. But, uh, uh, yeah. but thankfully, you yes. were able to make it. Yes. And yes. Uh, how many of them? Um, three girls, you three said. Girls. Three Which yeah. among them is towing your line? Um, OK, maybe the middle one. She's, she's a, a medic. Okay. Uh, she's a medical doctor. Um, if you are talking about health, then yeah. she's the one doing the line. When they were growing up, they wanted nothing to do with health okay. because they didn't like the job I was doing. It mm. was too hectic mm. and I was <laughs> all over the place. I'm rushing in, rushing out, traveling here, going back and forth. And they can hardly see you. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So they said, this is, this is your kind of job. We don't want it. <laughs> The first one is into, uh, she did psychology, but she's into human resource. She wants to pursue a profession in human resource mm. uh, management. Okay. The second one is just graduated from medical school. And the, the last one um, is into data analytics. Mm. What kind of a mother are you? Ouch. <laughs> you need to ask my daughter <laughs> what kind of a mother I, I, I am. Are um, you the strict sensor type or, I mean, how do you relate to your kids? Um, I, I try to relate to them nicely, but they think I'm too much. I mean, like, <laughs> I've been told once that on Saturday morning, I should learn to just lie in my room. Okay. Because as soon as I open the door, I want everybody to get up. <laughs> and I want to find work <laughs> for everybody to do this. 
you just don't have so to find So just stay work. there. I said, uh -huh. she just said, <laughs> just stay in your room. Because as soon as I open my door, everybody must get up and I have to find something. <laughs> Even if there's nothing to do, I have to find something for. But I, I, I love my girls and um, the, the time that I spend with them, I think we spend good times together. When they were growing up, um, I used to braid their hair for them. So mm. instead of going to the salon, I would. So we had a routine Friday after school, we'll wash our hair, we'll braid it braid with thread. It. Sunday, we'll do the Sunday church style. And then Sunday evening, we'll do cornrow for school. All the three of them for school and everything. Oh, wow. I'll do and you did it yourself? I did it myself. Oh, nice. Um, I'll do their snacks. So we'll, we'll bake cookies together. We'll bake little cakes. I'll pack their snacks mm. for them. Yeah. Now we'll that the, they're all grown, um, are they still very close? Yeah, they are quite close. We fight sometimes, but oh, <laughs> we, are, we are still close. <laughs> yeah, they would, um, recently, um, oh, this one of them sent me a message and said, oh, we are missing you. When are you coming home? I'm like, you miss me? <laughs> really? Wow, that is, that is nice. You, you know? don't love your Saturdays anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, because they, they live here and I'm in Ho. Yeah. Um, they are working okay. um, in Accra. So mm. when I get the chance, I come. If I have meetings, I come. But mm. most of the time, I'm in Ho. Mm. But when I come, it's nice to be with them. We sit and we chat. Or mm. we'll try and watch a movie together. Or we'll cook together and, and stuff. Like I that. can but imagine. Yeah. I must say, you look so beautiful, healthy. And I'm sure a lot must have gone into this. What do you do? to uh, keep fit and also to keep this beauty. Wow. You see, you're making me blush now. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do to keep but fit? That's true. Mm. Um, you know, I used to walk a lot. These days, um, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is willing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to eat very healthy. I like to eat lots of salads mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm. One of my biggest weaknesses is bread. Okay. Um, so sometimes the girls put a ban on me for eating bread because I, I can eat bread any time. Wow. But um, I try to skip. Okay. I try to walk a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I do it continuously, maybe for about a month, and then I do a travel, and then I, I stop. And then for another two or three months, I haven't done it. <laughs> then I have to tell myself, oh, God, I have to walk again. And then I start again. So yeah, I, I do bits and pieces. Uh, here and there, yeah. Uh -huh. um, hmm. But I try to be very health conscious. Yeah, very important. Yes. But again, I'm sure it's it hasn't been all research, research, research. Um, there's been times when um, you take it easy on yourself. I mean, after a hard day's work, what do you do to relax? <laughs> I have some two friends, and if they were here, they would have said she will go to the kitchen and go and bake. <laughs> That's not a bad when idea. <laughs> you see, when they're like, when somebody is tired, the person sleeps or relaxes. Okay. But then you find me going to try another recipe. Mm. I I like to bake, mm. um, and I I make fascinators. It's I, I just enjoy doing that. So did you make one for me? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made one. It's not finished, so we could complete it together. Together. So, and then okay. you wear it when you are that going. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Together, but that yeah. should, I mean, that would not prevent me from having a walk and skip with you as well. Maybe we can also do some gardening. Okay. Anything. Whatever you say. <laughs> whatever, whatever you so say. So viewers, it's a promise. <laughs> <laughs> do you also enjoy music sometimes? Yes, I, I enjoy good gospel music. Okay. Um, yeah, I love hymns. Mm. Mm. But I mean, aside hymns, there must be also other gospel music. I mean, which of the artists is your favorite? I love Adum. Adum by Dinah Hamilton, oh my I think. Goodness. Is that the one? That's the one. Into a well, so the essence of my praise is, is centered on your grace. Adam, Adam, Adam. I've been through a lot, but grace sustained me. My chest is now a testimony. So the essence of my praise. 
is centered on your grace. Adam, Adam, Adam. It was you, my lawyer in that courtroom. It was you, my soldier on that battlefield. So the essence of my praise is centered on your grace. Adam, Adam, Adam. Adam, Adam, Adam. Adam, 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 Adum, Adum, So the essence of my praise is centered on your grace. Adum, Adum, Adum. Oh, so Professor Margaret Japon. Japon. Thank you so much for opening up your doors for us to come in and sharing your beautiful life story with us. My beautiful dress was made by Needle Thread. Find them at uh, the 34 West Loop Tessano and call them on 0543196451. And again, you can visit their showroom at the 34 West Loop Tessano. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Don't forget that we'll be going uh, for a walk, we'll do a little <laughs> skipping, and if she's kind enough, we'll do gardening. <laughs> and w that fascinates, I've not forgotten. I'll get that also, <laughs> all of that shortly. Enjoy the rest of our program. <laughs> so that I can <laughs> but it didn't happen but at least I did well you did well you and did you did well. well too yeah oh that explains where the beauty is coming from <laughs> thank you so much for thank talking you, to I us we're really grateful that you allowed us to be here I want to say thank you for all the good work you've been doing God bless you same time next week another exciting edition awaits you on PM Personality Profile. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Enjoy the rest of our program. Thank you so much, bro. No, she likes it.